Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, the story of Queen will rock you in Bohemian Rhapsody. In 1970, Farouk Balsara, soon to rename himself Freddie Mercury, played by Rami Malek, meets Brian May and Roger Taylor, played by Gwilym Lee and Ben Hardy, and together, along with Joseph Mazzello's John Deacon, they form the band Queen. They quickly shoot to success, defying executives and critics with their experimental and revolutionary music, while Freddie begins a relationship with Mary. Mary Austin, played by Lucy Boynton, but realises that he is bisexual after he has affairs with men. As the band moves into the 80s, tensions begin to arise between them, which they must reconcile before their famous 1985 performance at Live Aid. Bohemian Rhapsody has not had an easy journey to the screen. It was originally set to star Sasha Baron Cohen as Freddie Mercury, with Queen members Brian May and Roger Taylor very involved with the project. But it seems that Cohen and May and Taylor never really saw saw eye to eye on the film, especially with regards to its story. Apparently when Cohen was attached to it, Mercury was going to die halfway through the film and the rest of it was going to shock Queen after his death. That was the reason that Cohen left the project largely, because he felt that no one really wanted to see a movie about Queen without Freddie Mercury for much of the running time. And obviously May and Taylor had much the same thoughts, because the film as we have it now focuses on Queen with Mercury fronting it, building up to Live Aid in 1985. But even with a new frontman in the form of Rami Malek, unfortunately there were still problems even during filming. Fox hired Brian Singer to direct the film of X-Men fame, who is infamously unreliable on set, and has a tendency to not show up or be very late, and on this movie he started fights with the cast and crew. Eventually, after their Thanksgiving break, he stopped showing up at all. The production was shut down for six weeks while they searched for a new director. That came in the form of Dexter Fletcher, best known for the Proclaimers musical Sunshine on Leaf, and he's directing the Elton John biopic Rocket Man, which comes out next year. He helped finish the film, including the post-production, but he doesn't have a director's credit. Singer still does due to Director's Guild rules, so Fletcher is uncredited except for an executive producer credit. So given all of that building up to the production of this movie, it's amazing that this is in any way competent and not an outright disaster. Everything you've heard about Rami Malek in this movie is true. He is incredible. He delivers a sensational performance as Freddie Mercury. He really captures his spirit and his energy, and he has the voice and the mannerisms down to a T. Anytime he's on screen, you are 100% convinced he is Freddie Mercury, and that is a formidable task for any actor, especially with someone who was a powerhouse on the stage like Mercury. He was someone that could make someone sat at the back feel like they were in the front row. He was such a terrific showman, and on screen, Malik as Mercury seems almost bigger than life in the performance scenes. Even though he's lip syncing, he still makes it feel very unpredictable. He really captures the charisma that Mercury brought to all of his performances. While that is perhaps the more challenging part of the role, when we have Mercury off the stage, when he's not being that person, he's someone more introverted. And what I found fascinating about Malak's performance is that you get the sense that Mercury is still trying to find himself over the course of the story. He's still trying to discover who he is, especially in terms of his identity and his sexuality. And I think that underneath the bravado that he brings to his music, there is a very distinct vulnerability to him. And I think that Malek really captures that in his performance. And it helps that in terms of visual period detail, the film is exemplary. It really is. All the wigs look terrific. The members of Queen look like spitting images of them at the time. Even bit parts of various historical figures like Bob Geldof or Kenny Everett all look very, very accurate. And it makes the film feel extraordinarily representative of the period of time. And it really makes you understand why Queen was such exciting performers. In fact, Malek's performance is so good that it's worth seeing the film for his performance alone, quite frankly. His acting is simply 
extraordinary in a way that I'm not sure the rest of the film is, unfortunately. Away from Malick, though, this is one of the most conventional music biopics I've seen in quite some time, and that's disappointing because that was not what Queen was known for. They were daring and experimental. They dabbled with several genres within their songs. This movie doesn't even remotely try to do anything like that. It hits all the notes that you would expect from this kind of movie, and it falls into many of the same pitfalls. One of the bigger ones is the fact that it simply tries to do too much. This is a movie that tries to cover all their major accomplishments, and as a result, you're trying to squeeze 15 years of history into two hours. As a result, you've got some really quite outrageous time compression at points. There's a scene fairly early on in this movie where Freddy is introducing his girlfriend to his parents for the first time. The band is also there. He mentions that he's changed his name over the course of the scene. And then they get a phone call from EMI saying that they've picked him up for a record deal all in the span of the same scene. And this happens several times over the course of Bohemian Rhapsody. As a result, it turns the timeline into something of a mush. But the other larger problem is that it never really gives you a full insight into the band because it's always surface level. It needs to keep moving to the next bit of history, the next accomplishment. And so if you're looking for any deeper insights into the band, you're not going to get that. And sometimes it can be quite entertaining to see them at work. Some of the better scenes in the movie are actually them working on their songs, especially the sequence where they're working on Bohemian Rhapsody. And you get to see their anarchy creative process, pushing the boundaries of their music and themselves. And this movie leaves no cliché unturned. I mean, obviously, when you're dealing with music as brilliant as Queen's, you're naturally going to use them in montages all across the movie. But you've also got things like touring montages, where the names of the cities fly across the screen, which is so old it's practically retro at this point. You've got other things like Mercury's hard-passing behaviour starts to cause a rift, in the band, he's got a disapproving father figure that he has to win over. That one, I think, glosses over something that I think is fairly important in that by changing his name, Mercury is downplayed as Indian Farsi background. But the movie never really investigates why, aside from one or two scenes and the obvious conclusion that he did it to escape from the racism and persecution that he experienced. But in general, it does feel like the movie glosses over a lot, and what makes the straightforward nature of the narrative worse is that this comes in a post-Walk Hard the Dewey Cox story age, and that movie sent up these tropes mercilessly, so when seeing them in this film, I couldn't help but think of that movie where they were making fun of them. And it does seem, at certain points, like this really doesn't have a particularly strong directorial hand, which is very understandable given the circumstances of its making. You can't really refer to either Singer or Fletcher as being a distinctive guiding voice. But I would like to hypothesise that perhaps what we should argue is the directors of this movie are May and Taylor. This feels very much like their movie. It feels like the history written by them, and a lot of the time it does feel like Bohemian Rhapsody is reading the history off their official website, essentially. It feels exactly as sort of clean-cut and very much sort of sanitised as you would expect, and it doesn't really have any kind of grit to it a lot of the time. It feels very much telling the history in a way that almost mythologizes it. Although I don't think that many of the audience members go and see this movie will particularly care about that. I think that many of them will be content to see that history being replayed with the music that they're familiar with. In fact, the band is presented in such a squeaky clean manner that actually makes them less interesting. They're certainly not as absorbing personalities as Mercury. May and Taylor definitely get moments in this movie. John Deacon doesn't really get a lot of them. He often falls into the background. There's a moment fairly late in this movie where they actually call attention to that. Mercury gets in an argument with his bandmate and he asks, who are you? And this guy's supposed to be a member of his band for the last 15 years. And he's pretty much saying what the audience are at that moment. You half expect him to almost say, wait, hang on, are you the kid from Jurassic Park? 
Because the movie's rushing through events, its pacing and tone is often very uneven, and this is especially exemplified in Mike Myers' role. Myers is really embarrassing in this movie, playing an EMI executive called Ray Foster, who is a fictionalised composite of all the executives that told Queen no, Bohemian Rhapsody cannot be a single. So we get two scenes of Myers with his Scottish accent, wearing these ridiculous sideburns and wig, and per permanent sunglasses and just ranting and raving about how ridiculous it is to have this song and it's all just for the sake of an extended in joke at one point he says well kids are never gonna rock out to this in cars do you get it because he was in wayne's world and that's exactly what he did. Like, I know the fact that he's in this movie is essentially paying tribute to the fact that because it was featured in Wayne's World, Bohemian Rhapsody shot back into the charts, but nevertheless, it feels ridiculously self-indulgent and extremely distracting and unconvincing. It feels like a caricature. The film's broadness doesn't really help it with dealing with Mercury's sexuality. Obviously, his relationship with Mary is a key component of the movie, they were very close friends in real life, and they have some nice scenes together, but the scene where he comes out to her as bisexual, I don't think is very well done, especially because she replies in response, well, face it, Freddy, you're gay. And it seems to me the movie has the same approach. It doesn't really mention that Freddie had relationships with other women after Mary. It focuses solely on those with men, and it does so in very obvious fashion sometimes, like the fact that Freddie's first fling with a man is depicted as him following someone into a truck stop bathroom, and the camera focuses on the door closing, saying, "Men." It doesn't get any less subtle than that. Because of the time span of the movie, Jim Hutton is actually probably the third most prominent LGBT figure in this movie. And considering that he played a major role in Mercury's life, that's very unfortunate. And the second most prominent is Paul Prenter, and he's depicted as the film's villain. He's the one that tries to turn Mercury against the band and manipulate him. And because of that, I think it might lend itself to some unfortunate readings to a certain extent, especially in the second half of the film. The third act of this movie, though, is really where the fiction starts to overtake the fact, and there are some big bones of contention. One of the faults with the time period that they've selected is that some of the events depicted in the film actually occurred after it, but they need to include them in the timeline of this movie, and the obvious one is Mercury's AIDS diagnosis. If you're making a movie about Mercury, you need to include that, so it's very understandable why they moved it on the timeline. However, it does manage to add a bittersweet quality onto his Live Aid performance that perhaps wasn't actually there in real life. But by far the bigger one is that much of the last act of this movie is totally fabricated. Mercury reveals the band that he's got a solo deal and he essentially breaks up Queen. This never happened. If I was a teacher marking this paper, this would get a big wrong written on it. There is no evidence that this ever happened. In fact, May and Taylor were already pursuing solo projects before Mercury at the time period this takes place. They went on several tours together. The band never broke up. So this is 100% incorrect. And then to compound that, we later see Mercury having to make a groveling apology to the band where he admits that, away from their input, his music wasn't that great. And that really doesn't sit well with me at all, especially because it feels like a, a backhanded insult to a certain extent, because it very much tries to attack Mercury's legacy as a solo performer and that away from Queen, it makes him much more closely tied with the band for his success. The film climaxes strongly with a lengthy recreation of their famous Live Aid performance, which is duplicated down to the smallest detail and is spectacular, and really gives you a sense of the band at the peak of their powers, especially with that enormous crowd in front of them. And with cinema surround sound, you really do feel like you're at a rock concert. In fact, it's so effective that it does make up for certain faults in the film beforehand. I do actually recommend Bohemian Rhapsody. I think that Rami Malek's performance is 
unbelievable and needs to be seen to be believed. And if you're a newcomer to Queen, I think this is a fairly good starting point. If you're not, I think you'll still enjoy going down memory lane and listening to all those wonderful songs again. That does not negate the fact, though, that it suffers from weak direction and takes some very serious liberties that does trouble me somewhat. However, I think the film works as a crowd pleaser, and I think that many people will be satisfied and rock out just as intended. Bohemian Rhapsody is an entertaining celebration of Queen, but it is strictly that and nothing more. Rami Malek is far and away the best thing about the movie, channeling Freddie Mercury to an almost uncanny degree, managing to capture both his exuberant showmanship but also his private insecurity that elevates a film which perhaps doesn't live up to the performance. For a band who broke the mould, Rhapsody is one of the most conventional music biopics in some time, determined to play the hit, literally when it comes to both their sensational music and the cliches of the genre, the it is a glowing surface level history of the band it covers in very broad strokes which doesn't aid the scenes dealing with Mercury's sexuality. But more egregiously the third act of the film goes to the length of revisionism far beyond dramatic effect with the plot becoming grossly inaccurate in a way that does a disservice to Mercury. There's no denying it is a crowd pleaser for fans and newcomers with its triumphant climactic recreation of Live Aid but the opportunity for a stronger more honest film about Queen has been missed. If you like this review then you can rock on over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out. You're a legend, Fred. We're all legends. <laughs>